Christmas, some, some time spent with family over Zoom or face-to-face, -face. hopefully it was all amazing. So just quick reminder, uh, we're a little thin today because we, the Christmas, uh, the Sunday after Christmas, we usually give all of our uh, Sunday school leaders a break to recoup or travel or whatever it is, so we have not had Sunday school today but it resumes next week after the new year, so do show up for your regular Sunday school classes. I got my notes here. Uh, just a friendly reminder, uh, when we do get a little more packed in this room, we do have overflow rooms in our fellowship hall and the library. If you guys don't feel comfortable with, you know, if someone's not wearing a mask close to you or we can't social distance as well as we want to, we do have those rooms available. So you don't have to sit next to people if you don't want to. So, um, I do want we do want to take a, a few minutes right now uh, to welcome the family, get a chance because people trickle in late. So, if you want to go ahead and take a few minutes, chat with the people around you, see how their Christmas was. We kind of call this our meet and greet family time. So, if you want to go ahead and just be respectful, shake hands or give a fist bump, and just see how each other were doing throughout the week. Is that cool? All right.
All right, all right. Thank you guys for doing that. That's awesome. So, Forrest Bolin is not here. He is our uh, Lottie Moon specialist. So I'm gonna fill in for his shoes this week while he's visiting family. But our Lottie Moon Christmas offering, we are right about the $9,000 mark with a goal of $12,000 for the rest of the year. So we're really close and we wanna hit that goal the best we can. So if you feel led, uh, today or in this week, you feel like the Lord's put on your heart to give, then we, we have a box and offering available even online that is through the International Missions Board. That is their Christmas offering. And we're going to play a quick video right here. It kind of gives us a little insight into what they do uh, around the world. So. <laughs> Nani ya mawai kuliwa na chawa? Nani ya mawai lala nja kwa street? Nani ya mawai dhurumiwa kimapenzi ama anajua mtu wa mawai dhurumiwa kwa street? Kudhurumiwa kimapenzi? Whenever I was hanging out with the boys, people would come to me and be like, you know these boys are dangerous, you know these boys are going to hurt you, you know you shouldn't be here. And they're just despised by everyone. Only a few understand that these are just normal children who have been forced to the streets with different circumstances. They're not loved. They're actively insulted and abused and kicked. Show them love and they will respond with love. Show them a bad attitude and they will repel from you. They are just children. In 2009, 2010, I was serving as a photographer with the International Mission Board, and one of my last assignments was a story on a young lady working with street kids in Nairobi, Kenya. I would spend from four in the morning to 10 at night with this group of 20 kids, getting to know them, hearing more they were on the streets, and the whole time I was like, oh my gosh, the Lord is gonna call somebody to work with these kids. Like, somebody needs to come do something. So I finally just said, Lord, are you calling me to go work with those boys? And I had peace. Like, I knew that that's what I was being called to do. Hopefully 13 boys will come to the shelter this morning. Um, and they'll be rescued off the streets. Honestly, there were so many years that I worked on the streets in Nairobi without a place to take boys. I would just get to know them and help them like in the small ways that I could. Um, and the fact that God has provided the shelter um, and given us opportunity to be rescuing kids off the streets and make a real difference in their life. It's really exciting. Like, life will not be the same for these boys. And Naivasha Children's Shelter, our mission is to rescue them from the streets, to help them to be rehabilitated, to get off drugs, to go through trauma counseling. And as much as we see that these kids need food and they need education and they need a bed to sleep in, they do, they need all of those things. But what they really need is the love of a family. They need to belong somewhere. They need to be well cared for. 
they need to know that they're loved. And we show them that through the love that the social workers give them here. We show them that by pointing to the love of Christ and we show them that by putting them back in their family where they belong with people who love them. One of our social workers, Elphis, will spend hours looking for one kid that's lost that he wants to be able to have a new life. Um, and it's not just Elphis, all of the social workers at the shelter are amazing. They go to the streets every day and every night. They get to know the boys, they get to hear their story, know why they came to the streets, know what happened in their family, and offer them a way out. I talk to them, I make them understand that despite everything that you're going through, there is hope and there is someone who cares. That's why I'm here. I had seen enough of orphanages, I had worked with enough organizations that I knew the best place for any child is in their family. And we don't just take them home and drop them off. What we do is we spend a lot of time going to the family and finding out what sent that child to the streets. Was it the influence of peers? Was it poverty at home? And then spend a lot of time working on that issue with the family. Every child that's placed back at home, they follow them until they reach the age of 18 or they finish school. Just to make sure that child has no chance of going back to the streets, everything is fine, they have enough food, they're in school, they invest their lives in these children. I'm sure that these kids, if given a chance and a place to make their lives, for sure they are going to change and make a better generation to come. I just want to sincerely say thank you. It is because of Southern Baptist that I am able to be here. The shelter is able to keep running. I'm able to serve in this way because of your gifts to the Lottie Moon Christmas Offering and the Cooperative Program. And it's miraculous to see a child that was alone living on the streets and hopeless uh, reunited with their family. This is the model that works. This is what helps to get kids back home where they should be and where they want to be. Centerpoint Church and whoever else you want to invite to a ladies Bible study starting the first of the year. We're going to be doing this book. It's called Peace and How to Keep It. And if you know anything about me at all, you know that the Word of God is more than just words to me. It's, uh, it's life and breath to me. It is what gets me out of bed in the morning. It's what kept me from suicide for years. It is everything to me. And this study is of the truths of God's word that lead to a life of peace. And it is not just a list of verses that use the word peace. I believe that there are certain overarching truths of God's word that when they are, when we know them and when we believe them, when we truly live them out, we can have a life of peace even when times are not peaceful. And I know that right now they very much are not uh, with the pandemic, with politics the way they are and the economy and just everything. Just living in the 21st century, there are a thousand things that demand our attention at any given moment. And for me to survive in this world, I have to constantly preach peace to myself. So that's really all this study is, is me preaching to myself. <laughs> And you are welcome to come and listen. Um, all of the details, when, where, and so forth are on this slide. They are also, I believe, in the bulletin. And you can find anything you need to know at livingthetruth.org. Um, I hope that if you are someone who could use a little more peace this year, uh, that you will consider joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Courtney. Why don't we stand up? Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we begin our worship time. Father God, Lord, we thank you for what this time represents, Lord. The birth of your son and the sacrifice that he made with his life, Lord, so that we could spend eternity with you. Father, now we come to the time of worship in this service, Lord God, and I just pray that you would lead each and every one of us through this with your Holy Spirit, that we would glorify you with the way that we worship. 
Father, if our heart is not right, Lord, would you help us to go to you now in this prayer? Father, maybe there's sin, maybe there's something just blocking our minds and our hearts. And I just pray right now, Lord, that we would, Lord, just repent to you, just say that we're sorry, that we didn't make this maybe what it was, what it should be about, which is your son. Help us now, Father, to worship you with all of our hearts, and may you be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. Sing with angels we have heard on high, sweetly singing o'er the plains, and the mountains in reply, echoing their joy strain. Shepherds, why this do? next song is uh, a little bit of a different uh, rendition. If you go to our church, you've heard it before, but if you're new, maybe you haven't. It's called Hark the Herald Angels Sing, King of Heaven. See glory to 
Good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David is born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger.
The stars are brightly shining It is the night of our dear Savior's birth Lonely in the world In sin and ever pining Till he appeared And the soul felt its worth a thrill of hope The weary world rejoices For yonder breaks A new and glorious morn Fall on your knees Oh, he
Someday you're gonna go home again But you leave your spirit And fly the world with joy You'll be here I'm holding you so near I'm staring into the face of my Savior King and Creator Father God, we thank you that you are here, Lord, that you came to this earth, Lord, and sacrificed. First, you showed us how to live this life. Lord, you showed us how to serve, how to not think of ourselves in incredibly special occasions like this where we should be worshiping you for who you are, where we should be out serving others. So, Lord God, Remind us today how we can make a better 2021 and glorify you through all that we do. And may we do that in remembrance, Lord God, of you for all that you have done for us. Father God, we love you. I pray this has glorified you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Man, thank you, Bart and worship team. So thankful for our faithful, faithful worship team. Boy, long hours of practice, week in and week out, and especially with all that's gone on this year, they have, they have consistently been there to lead us to the throne. And uh, grateful for you folks. Faithful, diligent, just thank you for all the different ways that you've supported us, encouraged us, blessed us this, uh, this year with your prayers and your concern and your... You know, just kind of follow up to see how we're doing, your faithful giving, just everything that you have done as you've worshiped the Lord here, we're so grateful for. You know, the last Sunday of the year, um, I, I can just remember when I was doing the first Sunday sermon of the year and had no clue what this year was going to be like. But when we get to the end of the year, you're probably just like I am. You, you tend to stop and turn around and look back and go, what was that, right? What was that all about? What is it, Lord, that you want me to learn from this past year? What could I do differently? What, uh, what do I know now that I didn't know then? And, and how would it have affected how I went through this year? And so it, it just kind of began that thought process where we um, started ruminating on scripture and thinking of different scriptures. And, you know, one of the things that first popped into my mind was that, that Micah 6, 8 uh, verse that my mind goes to so very often. Lord, what is it that you really want out of me? You know, what is it that means more to you than anything else? And that simple, succinct verse that just said, this is what I want. I, I want you to what? Do justice? I want you to love mercy or kindness and I want you to walk humbly with our God. And I see throughout Scripture over and over and over again, what God desires more than anything else is a relationship with us that's intimate, that is real, that is full, that is meaningful. And so probably the second verse that, uh, that my mind went to is really, uh, where I really want to spend some time with you on this morning. And it's just that wonderful uh, probably most often quoted verse out of Jeremiah that, that takes first place with all the ones that you hear. And it's that, that wonderful verse, I've got plans for you, right? I've got plans for you, declares the Lord. And uh, they are plans for, uh, you know, my translation that I put up says welfare, but really uh, the verse that, uh, the, the word that's used a lot more often is, is prosper, 
You know, I have plans to prosper you. I have plans to bless you. I have plans to give you a future and a hope. And, uh, and the most powerful part of that promise is the backstory. And it's, it's a story we don't very often get. And so this morning I'd like to spend just a few minutes with you walking through a few chapters in Jeremiah to see what that promise really is all about. And as we prepare to do that, would you join me in prayer to ask the Lord's blessing? Father, we're so grateful for the worship music that, uh, that led us into your presence this morning to worship you. Uh, I pray that our hearts before you now are hearts that are still full and, and giving in our worship by how we pay attention to your word. And how we come to your word with, with a curiosity and an interest and a desire to learn and grow. Father, I pray that you would teach us uh, from today's passage. That you, your spirit would speak to us and that we, would, that we would find ourselves understanding your heart even more. And that our desire to please that heart would continue to grow even throughout this new year. So Spirit, please teach us and please lead us and guide us in your word this morning and we'll thank you for it and we'll ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you spend much time in Jeremiah, you'll know that, uh, that it really is a heavy book and Jeremiah was known as the weeping prophet because he cried a lot because most all of his messages really centered around the judgment that God was going to send toward Judah because of their unwillingness to submit to him, their unwillingness to love him, their unwillingness to obey him. They chose consistently to follow false prophets, and they worshipped idols, and there were so many other things that, that were in their life that were crowding out God, that God's desire was to reach out and pull them back. And one of the ways that he went about accomplishing that was to speak, you know, kind of prophecy after prophecy after prophecy through Jeremiah. Um, really, the first part of the book is a series of 14 different messages to, uh, to the people of Judah and Jerusalem. And uh, we will not take time for all 14 of those messages, but I'd love to invite you to jump in with me in chapter 24. And this will be kind of one of those walking uh, messages where we're going to cover a lot of ground, way too many verses to try to put up on the screen, but I'll try to keep you uh, uh, up to where we are so you'll understand the backstory to this great promise where the Lord says, I've got plans for you, and they're good plans, and they're plans uh, that will end with a hopeful future, an incredible blessing. But if we go back to chapter 24, where we pick up now is Nebuchadnezzar has just assumed the throne in Babylon. And one of the first things he did, did was to sweep down and begin to kind of sift through the people of Judah and take all the especially talented ones and gifted ones and royal ones and the young men. And Daniel's a story that comes to your mind. That's, that's when all of this was going on. And Nebuchadnezzar was just saying, I want to make my, my empire the best that it can possibly be. So I need, I need the cream of the crop of all of the nations that I conquer. And I'll bring them in and they won't be so much slaves as they will be colonists. And I, I will allow them to live and to marry and to have somewhat normal lives. But they will bring their expertise into my kingdom. And that was his philosophy. So as we pick up in chapter 24, he's already taken into exile in verse 1. You know, some of the royalty, some of the officials, the craftsmen, the metal workers brought them to Babylon. And so that, that event has already happened. And so the Lord reveals a vision to Jeremiah to help him understand what's going on. And in verse 2, this vision looks like this. One basket had a collection of very good figs, like first ripe figs. The other basket had very bad figs, so bad they couldn't be eat, eaten. And the Lord says, Jeremiah, what do you see? And he says, well, I see two baskets, good figs, bad figs. And the Lord says, okay, let me explain to you what this means. In verse 5, thus says the Lord to God of Israel, like these good figs, so I will regard as good the exiles from Judah, whom I have sent away from this place to the land of the Chaldeans. 
I will set my eyes on them for good, and I will bring them back to this land. I will build them up. I will not tear them down. I will plant them. I will not pluck them up. I will give them a heart to know that I am the Lord. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God, for they shall return to me with their whole heart. Jeremiah, that's the exiles. You know, and it's so easy because Jerusalem was filled with false prophets. And many of these prophets were saying during this time, hey, don't worry. The exiles that went away into Babylon, they were kind of the troublemakers. They were the problem. God got rid of them, but we're left behind here in Jerusalem. We're the good ones. And so don't worry. A couple of years, God is going to break the the, the control of Nebuchadnezzar and everything that we lost is coming back. And that's not true. That's not what was going to happen. And so God is telling his faithful prophet, uh, Jeremiah, no, no, this is the real story. The real story is that the good ones have left. And they will come back one day, but it is not going to be according to the word of the false prophets. That timeline is not going to be accurate. And so uh, Jeremiah is trying to, um, in kind of in competition with all of the false prophets, he's trying to convince the people of, uh, of Jerusalem and, and Judah, no, no, what they're telling you is wrong. This is what the Lord is really saying. You need to be prepared for this. And the rest of that vision goes on to say, but the bad figs, those are the ones that are left in Jerusalem. And I will deal with them and I will send... Um, you know, a sword and pestilence and, and I will wipe them out. And it wasn't arbitrary, but it was because they were the ones who were rebellious against the Lord. Those prophets who were living in open sin and they were making up all kinds of, of words from the Lord that weren't accurate. And the Lord says, we are just going to, we're going to remove them from the face of the earth. Chapter 25, we're given a little insight as to even further back what's been going on. And this is so important. I just felt like we really needed to look at this quickly. But in chapter 25, verse 3, look at this. The Lord is saying through Jeremiah, for 23 years, from the 13th year of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, to this day, the word of the Lord has come to me, Jeremiah is saying, and I have spoke persistently to you, but you've not listened. You have neither listened nor inclined your ears to hear, though the Lord persistently sent to you all his servants, the prophets, saying, turn now every one of you from his evil way and evil deeds and dwell upon the land that the Lord has given to you and your fathers from of old and forever. Do not go after other gods to serve and worship them or provoke me to anger with the work of your hands. Then I will do you no harm. 23 years I have been preaching to you, encouraging you to follow me, to put away the idols in your life, to choose me above everything else. 23 years of faithful proclamation through Jeremiah. And he says, but you haven't listened. You haven't even, you know, kind of leaned in my direction. You've turned me off. Verse 8 Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, because you have not obeyed my words, behold, I will send for all the tribes of the north, declares the Lord, and for Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant. And I will bring them against this land and its inhabitants and against all these surrounding nations. God is so patient. He is so long-suffering. You know, and all of these things apply to us. We're told that everything that happened in the Old Testament was literally written down for our learning, for our example, so that we could glean from mistakes that were made before and not have to make the same mistakes. And even though we talk about idols all the time, and I'm afraid that sometimes in our mind we, we instantly think of the, you know, the statue of Baal or the calf or whatever idol it was that Israel was worshiping at the time. But the truth is that you and I regularly struggle with idols in our own life. And they might not be statues and they might not be something sitting on a special table in our house. But they are things that we turn to 
for our joy and for our entertainment and for our pleasure way before we turn to the Lord. These are some of the things that just eat up all of our time so that we don't have time left for the Lord. And we need to understand that in a very real sense, we, 21st century, we are as guilty of idolatry oftentimes as were the people of Israel. And so these are not just old-fashioned challenges thrown out to a people that are long dead and gone that have no bearing on us. This really all does apply to us. And over and over and over in Scripture, we just keep reading about how God, just he, he's just after our heart. He just wants our heart. He wants us to love him. He wants us to desire to be with him. He wants us to, to enjoy his presence, to enjoy his word, to enjoy being together as a family, to make it a priority, to make it important. It hasn't changed since the days of Jeremiah. The Lord is still after the hearts of his people. That's what he wants. It's, it's what he is trying to accomplish. This whole idea of plan you know, you ask me, and I've tried a bunch of times this year to give you an idea. Maybe this is what God's plan for the pandemic is all about. I don't really know. I can't stand up here and be dogmatic and say, yes, it's for this or this or this. And I'm certainly not going to be like the false prophet and tell you, oh, don't worry, in two months it's all going to be over. It's going to be done. Because I don't know. But what I do know is that the plan of God that is right now underway will be accomplished. And more than anything else, what he is desirous to, to finish through this pandemic is that process in your life of, of calling you into a closer, more intimate relationship with him. A relationship where you talk to him regularly. And I mean way beyond the dinner table. That relationship where you wake up in the morning and just, just naturally because you want to, you find yourself saying, good morning, Lord. I'm so disappointed you didn't come and take me home last night while I was sleeping. But since I'm still here, what do you have for me today? What is it that you want me to do? A relationship where when you get up, really the first thing that you want to do is spend time in God's word. Maybe not a lot of time. And maybe your newborn baby isn't going to cooperate and that's not going to be the first thing you're going to get to do. But God is after a people whose heart is, is always wanting to be with him. So much so that when you're out the door and on the way to work, you're talking to him as you're driving. You're, you're listening to worship music. You're listening to scripture. You're listening to, to a, a sermon from somebody that you love to listen to their sermons. It's, it's, it's just, I want more input. I want more insight. I want to grow. I want to learn. I want to be more like Jesus. With your whole heart, that's what God is after. So as we pick up in this chapter 29 of Jeremiah, and in these verses we now understand that these are words that Jeremiah wrote to the exiles and he gave them to a, you know, to a, a Pony Express writer and got the letter where it was supposed to be. Listen to these words in verse 4 where the Lord speaking to the exiles. And this is, I mean, this is incredible because you have to remind yourself, these were people that were ripped up from their homes. They were separated from their families. They were taken as captives to Babylon, to a pagan land, a place where they, they worshiped pagan idols, a place where you know, they were given, at least from Daniel's account, they were all given pagan names to replace their godly names. They were brainwashed, or at least the attempt was made to brainwash and to turn them into Chaldeans, into Babylonians. And we see now kind of a little bit of a different a side of that coin as we read the counsel that the Lord told Jeremiah to give to the exiles, beginning in verse 4. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I've sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. And please don't miss the fact that the Lord keeps saying, I sent, 
I did this. This was my plan. I accomplished this. Didn't blame it on Nebuchadnezzar. In fact, he calls Nebuchadnezzar a servant. And from the book of Daniel, we believe that Nebuchadnezzar could very well have accepted Yahweh God as his God before his life was over. But God's behind all of this. And so the counsel to the exiles who are now in Babylon, evidently they haven't been there very long, is this, verse 5, build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there. Do not decrease. You're in captivity. But I don't want you to live like a captive people. You're not in your homeland. You're away from the temple. You're away from the priest. You're away from your religious system. You're away from your, your culture, your heritage. I don't know if they were allowed to celebrate their, their, uh, their traditions and their feast, but they were in a foreign country under foreign denom- uh, domination. And yet God says to them, listen, I want you to flourish where I have placed you. I want you to marry. And he's always, he's always meaning, I want you to marry among the Jews. He's not telling them to intermarry with the Babylonians. He said, I want you to marry. I want you to choose godly Jewish young ladies for your sons. And, you know, and, and young men for your daughters. I want you to grow. I want you to multiply. I want you to... To flourish there and not decrease. Verse 7. Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile. And pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare you will find your welfare. Incredible counsel. And you have to remember in the back of your mind. In Jerusalem you have all these false prophets saying. Don't worry, friends, the, you know, the, the Lord will visit us again. And within two years, Nebuchadnezzar will be dead and his empire will be crushed and we will be back together again. And here's, you know, here's Jeremiah's counsel to the exiles. Just, just relax, right? Understand this is not going to be a quick fix. I have put you where I want you. I have done it for a specific reason. And while you're there, I want you to pray for my blessing on the captors that are holding you. I want you to pray for their blessing, for their growth, for their prospering. Because as they prosper, you will prosper too. Well, let's pick up. And as we look at these, these next few verses, what is the Lord? He kind of gives to them the idea of, of what he's doing and why he's doing it. Verse 10, for thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans that I have for you. Declares the Lord, plans for your good welfare, uh, plans for the prosper prospering of your nation and your people and not for evil to give you a future and a hope and that phrase really should be squeezed together and it should just be and to give you a hopeful future a future that will be fulfilled in hope then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you you will seek me and find me When you seek me with all of your heart, I will be found by you, declares the Lord. And I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I've driven you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. What was God's plan from the beginning? What is God's plan for your your life and for mine? is that we might learn to seek him with a whole heart. That we might learn to not be satisfied with the idols that the world will line up for us to worship. 
that we will not be content with this, this uh, approach to life where everything that we think we have to do takes first place and we give God whatever's left out of our resources, out of our time, out of our attention, but mostly out of our affection. I mean, I look back at this year and encourage you to look back on your 2020. What place did God have in your heart? What place did God have in your affection? Everything was turned upside down. Everything was different. And God gave to us, as individuals, he gave to us the opportunity to see our heart revealed. To see what's really in our heart. Was that, was that a pretty picture? Do you look back over this last year and think, wow, I really could have done so much better. I could have better used my time. I could have better used my resources. I could have better used my witnessing opportunities, my, my looking for ways to help and bless people. Maybe you find yourself saying, what I really did is I just hunkered down and I waited for the storm to blow over. Because I just thought if we can just get back to the way things were, then I can start doing what it was I was doing. And I sometimes wonder if God's response to that might be, but that's why I changed it up. So that you'd stop doing what you were doing. That you would start longing more to be with me and to talk to me and to listen to me and to worship me and to celebrate the blessings that I've given to you. And so he took our world and he shook it real hard. And there were times, there were months when we kind of felt like we were in free fall. We had no idea what was going on. We had no idea what next week was going to look like. We were just scrambling to try to cover this week. And I just remember as I, as I sat in front of my fireplace trying to record a message to an empty room thinking, what in the world <laughs> is this all about? Is anybody even going to watch this? Is anybody even going to listen to this? And isn't there some way I can do this without my face being right in the middle of the camera? Is, isn't there a way around that? It all was different. In it I read, not just from this account, but event after event after event from the beginning of the Bible all through the Old Testament. And what is God consistently saying? I got a plan for you. But it requires that you love me with all of your heart. That you seek me with all of your affection. No, it doesn't mean that every waking second of every day all we think about is God and that every penny we make we give to God and everything we do is only church related. It doesn't mean that. It just means that as we are going through life serving the Lord at work, at home, at church, wherever we are, whatever we're doing, that we have this, this mentality that says, I'm doing the best I can to serve my Lord because I love him. He's been so good to me, so gracious to me, so forgiving, so patient, so merciful. And every chance I get, I, I, I do want to talk to him. Every chance I get, I do want to, to meditate on his word. God is after our hearts. And so I don't know exactly what his plan is for this pandemic. I, I don't know how long it's going to last. I don't know how much uglier it's going to get. But I do know this, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that in the midst of all that's going on, more than anything else, God is after your heart. And he's after mine. And he will not give up on us. He preached through Jeremiah for 23 years to a people who wouldn't listen. How long will he preach to us? And would we make him do 23 years because we're not listening? Oh, I hope not. I mean, I hope 2021 finds us memorizing Scripture again, thinking about Scripture again, talking with our friends about Scripture, reading books to stimulate our spiritual life, listening to other pastors bring other sermons that feed our soul and, and encourage us to the Savior. 
and maybe pushing away some of those things that have become time wasters because they're not really profitable. They really don't do anything. Maybe changing up our habits in order that they don't have quite so much the foothold that they used to. And every day coming back to that point where we recognize, even to say out loud, Jesus, I know you want my heart today. I know you want my heart today. I know you want me to seek you with my whole heart. I'm here to do that. Please give me a heart to know you. And I will respond to that with a desire to walk with you. And if you will approach the new year like that, if I will approach the new year like that, it won't make any difference what's going on around us. Whether we're still in captivity or whether we're finally in our homeland free once again. God will accomplish the desire of his heart. And his plan for you and his plan for me is so beyond our ability to to understand it. I mean, I know ultimately his plan for me is eternity in the new Jerusalem, right? In the city of gold with eyes that work better than these and teeth that will stay in place and, and a head that's covered with hair. I'm just hoping that that's part of heaven. You know, that my hair will come back. But beyond all that, right, I will finally and fully be like Jesus. And I'll be surrounded by people like Jesus. And we will laugh and we will sing and we will dance and we will celebrate for all of eternity. I mean, that that is a prospering uh, blessing, isn't it? That is as prosperous as you and I will ever be. And I know that ultimately that is the plan that God has for me. But until that time, he has a really, really, really good plan for us as well. And if we will seek him with all of our heart and all of our mind and all of our soul and all of our strength, he will bless our socks off. And it might not be with money or material things, but we will be so wealthy in the ways that really matter that we will barely be able to contain ourselves. That's what I want for me. That's what I want for you. And so I want to encourage you this morning as you kind of live through the last few days of 2020 and join me in thanking the Lord that they're finally over and gone Would you with me as well look forward and say, but Lord, may 2021 be the year in which my heart goes after you harder than it ever has before. Because literally, 2021 could be the year of his return. If he doesn't come in these last few days of December, it could be the year that we've been waiting for. It could be the moment that we've been dreaming of maybe more than ever this last year when we hear the trumpet sound, when we go through space so quickly that it's like the twinkle of an eye, when we find ourselves in his presence with new robes and a glorified body and a home that just will blow our mind and the privilege for all of eternity without interruption to worship the Lord. Oh, let's make next year the year when we flourish, when he blesses us beyond our ability to understand because we have responded to his call to to seek me, to look for me, to diligently hunt for me. And he makes that promise. And if you'll do that, I promise you, you will find me. May next year be that year. Lord, thank you for just more blessings than we can imagine, more prospects that we have to look forward to. Lord, thank you for reminding us that your plan for us will ultimately end in heaven. But Lord, challenge us this morning that as you want our hearts 
that we would respond to that desire and that we would give ourselves to seek after you and to spend time in your word and time in prayer, time with your people. Lord, would you please finish that plan and make us a people who do not worship idols, a people whose affections are not divided, whose attention is not diverted or distracted. Lord, would you make us a people after your own heart, a people in love with you, a people consumed by your word, a people anxious to share it with others, a people that remember that regardless of whether we're in captivity or whether we're free, we still have a calling to pray for our nation and to pray for its leaders because we're still a part of that nation and and their blessing will ultimately end up in our blessing. We're all in this together. And even though we don't know what that's going to look like, Lord, we just commit our nation into your hands. And I pray that you would send revival. I pray that there would be a turning back to you and that people would once again, even as you told Jeremiah to share with the exiles in Babylon, the people would seek after God with their whole heart so that they could find you. Lord, thank you for your goodness to us, your blessings on us, your patience with us. And we just ask that you would bring to completion what you're in the process of working in us even now. And we'll give you the honor, the glory, the praise for all that you've done, that you're doing, and all that you have yet to accomplish. Lord, just have your way with me. Have your way with us, we pray. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great rest of the, of the year. pray that your new year would be filled with joy and blessing and excitement and anticipation.